everybody. Thanks for tuning in to our weekly poetry series. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined today by three poets, uh, Julie E. Blamaki, Gia Oak Baker, and Shante Orion. Uh, Julie's book, Slide to Unlock, was just published in March, and Gia and Shante collaborated on the book, Gravity and Spectacle, that came out in April. You can order both of their books from our store, Read It Again, with links provided in the comments. Um, the conversation tonight is going to center on ekphrastic poetry, which is poetry that engages with the visual arts. And we're going to begin with Gia reading an ekphrastic poem of her own. Uh, Gia Oak Baker's poetry chapbooks include Crash Landing in the Plaza of an Unknown City and Well Enough to Travel. Her photography can be seen in 82 Review, Lime Hawk, Shrew, Rascal, Thimble Literary Magazine, Stirring, a literary collection, A Dozen Nothing, and elsewhere. Gravity and Spectacle, a full-length collection of photography and poetry in collaboration with Shantae Ryan, was released in April from Tolson Books. Uh, Gia received a grant from the Arizona Commission on the Arts and has been awarded residencies from the Helene Wurlitzer Foundation and Hedgebrook. You can see more of her stuff on Instagram at VioletSky29. All right, Julie, um, you're up, or Gia, sorry, you're up. <laughs> Um, just really quick, I wanted to thank you, Nicole and Kim and Read It Again Books for hosting tonight and for having us. Um, it's such an honor to be a part of this. And for um, anyone and everyone who's out there, we can't see you, but um, thank you for sharing your Friday night with us. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm just going to read one poem. Um, this is a, an older piece um, that is meaningful to me because it's one of the ways that I got to know both Shante and um, Julie. And it's um, an ekphrastic piece called You Who Are Getting Obliterated in the Dancing Swarm of Fireflies. And it's based on the installation by Yayo Kusama that's um, a permanent part of the collection at the Phoenix Art Museum. So you who are getting obliterated in the dancing swarm of fireflies had best not feel too much. The night train rushes through the meadow and its two-step rumbling reminds you you're alone. When the room begins to spin, it forms a union with the light, one unceasing streak turns circle, and you, surrounded by mirrors, go vertigo in the immense empty between one minute and the next. Fireflies expand into stars. Who are we to find in infinite spaces but ourselves? Call it an ostinato, a vamp, the unchanging refrain of beginnings and endings, starts and stops, resonates in time like steel on steel, and we know it. Somewhere deep in the tall grass, my hands are still fastened to his holding fast. Um, so that poem I read for the first time in public at a reading um, in a small uh, gallery called Deus Ex Machina in, um, in Phoenix that Shante hosted. And he read a poem that night as well. And both those poems ended up being in the same journal the same issue at the same time. Um, it was a, a magazine called Thin Air out of NAU, which was just a little bit crazy that that happened. And so that was the first night that I'd ever met Shantae, that that very same poem ended up being anthologized next to a poem of Shantae's and Julie's, um, which is how I also got to know Julie. So that's kind of the, the backstory on that poem. Thank you. Um... That was great. It was a really nice poem. I love it. Thank you. Um, and now uh, Julie is going to read for 15 minutes. And Julie E. Blomacki is a native of Toledo, Ohio. She received an MFA through the Bennington Writers Seminars and an MA on, from the University of South Carolina, where she was chosen as a Ramsar Fellow and studied with James Dickey. Currently in Atlanta, Georgia, she has served as a fellow at the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and has been in residency at the Bowers House Literary Center. Her poems have been widely anthologized and appeared in numerous literary journals, including Gulf Coast, Prairie Schooner, Poet Lore, uh, Chautauqua Literary Journal, Journal, Palooka Magazine, South Dakota Review, The Cortland Review, Bridge 8 Literary Magazine, and others. Her ekphrastic work has been published and showcased in collaborations with the Toledo Museum of Art and Phoenix Museum of Art. A freelance writer, editor, and guest lecturer, her interviews have recently appeared in the AWP Writers Chronicle and in Poetry International. Slide to Unlock was a finalist and semi-finalist for multiple book prizes, including the Meg Swenson Poetry Prize in 2016. It is her first full-length poetry collection. All right, Julie. 
Thank you so much, Nicole. Gia, I love um, that we were able to start off with that poem because um, what we've talked about, Nicole, a lot is how much we've all sort of come together in serendipity and kismet. And I had read Gia's poem next to uh, the Kusama exhibition, and then that's how I came to know her work. And then we met and met Jake Friedman through um, mm -hmm. Four Chambers Press, and then I met Shantae. And then Shantae and I, the first time we met, we read together with Four Chambers Press at Valley Bar in Phoenix. So I love that there's this opportunity to bring together uh, sort of West Coast, East Coast um, tonight. So first of all, I want to open by saying thank you so much, um, Nicole and Kim and Read It Again Books for inviting us to be a part of this. And thank you to Stacey Asaf too, if you're out there for, um, for introducing us. And I want to say thank you to Gia and Shante for being here. I, I, we, I'm so happy to be able to share in this energy and, and share all this energy with you. And thank you to each of you that are listening. As, as Gia said, we don't know who's out there, but we're sending the poetry love to you. And thank you for taking time on your Friday night to, to share in with us. Um, so I'm also very, very grateful that Slide to Unlock and Gravity and Spectacle came into the world at the same time, because then that allows us to amplify the excitement. So that's what we're doing. Um, I also wanna take a minute um, to say that I am honored that we're reading on May 8th, uh, which is the birthday of Almad Arbery, mm -hmm. and uh, that I walked 2.23 miles in his honor today. Um, I would be remiss not to say that because we're in Georgia, so. Okay, um, I'm going to be reading from my first full length collection, Slide to Unlock, which um, I'm gonna take a moment to tell you about it and then I'll jump into the poems. So uh, it debuted in March, 2020 with Sibling Rivalry Press. Um, I've spent a decade working on this manuscript that questions our boundaries of intimacy within a digital landscape. How do we know each other differently over screens versus in person and how do we navigate that knowing? So Slide to Unlock explores that in a number of ways, but mainly through two. The first is through a narrative arc, which is also a bit of a love story. And the second is through inviting us to reflect on the seduction of technology language, the deeper implications of words like cellular and commands, because they are commands like Slide to Unlock. However, Slide to Unlock also plays with gaze and image, perception and perspective, and part of that play is considering the role of the visual. So photography, paintings, even computer and phone screens, as you are experiencing right now. So what an eerie and maybe preordained time for this book to arrive in the world when we're experiencing so much touch without touch, and when we are connecting over screen versus in person and doing the best we can. So as we were talking image and poem and riffing on the ekphrastic today, um, I'm going to go ahead and read four poems that um, illustrate how I played in that arena um, in Slide to Unlock. So um, I'm going to open with what would be considered a more traditional um, ekphrastic poem. And, and Nicole, thank you for giving um, the definition to kind of kick us off, but I'll, I'll expand on it a little bit too. So ekphrastic is from the Greek ekphrasis, meaning essentially a lucid explanation or a poem written in response to art. Um, and the one that I'm opening with um, because of technology, here's the beautiful thing. I can actually show you the painting um, that inspired this poem. So hopefully I'll do this correctly, but this is, um, yeah, I hopefully you could see it. Uh, this is Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with cropped hair. And there's a whole backstory behind this painting, which I won't go into too much. What you need to know is it was written after her separation from Diego. And in the painting, she has cut off all of her hair, which was one of the things that he loved most about her. And she's in his suit. So already subverting gender roles. So this is uh, severed after Frida Kahlo's self-portrait with cropped hair. Suited, I become undressed. Heft of steel at my neck, nest of snakes at my feet, 
no mantilla, no rebozo, my broken hospital gown hanging over Gringolandia. I am no fair dove in this pin-striped elephant, my brow bones deceiving. I raise what is sharp. I take my hair down. All that flowers turns to threads, rising up against the fabric of you. See the blood shirt, the barren lapel. Only my shoes remain. Point back to the sinister chair, the true pocket of this coat. Scissors, paintbrush, the fire work of my heart. Stilettos turned inward past every last rib. And the next three poems are all um, different takes on the ekphrastic and they all involve the same painting. So I'm going to um, show that to you now. And this, I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and this painting is at the Toledo Museum of Art. Um, so here we go. This is, um, was painted in 1888. And this is Claude Monet's Antibe, a scene from La Salle. Um, this is the second poem is a bit of a longer poem. Um, this particular painting becomes a bit of a talisman in the book. So a touch point that um, the narrative kind of keeps going back to. Um, this particular poem is um, engaging the emphrastic through the ekphrastic through emotion. So um, it's also, it's working on a number of levels and also incorporating phrases that have been translated from Monet's letters about the creative process and the rendering of light. And if you haven't had the opportunity to read any of his letters translated, I highly recommend it. Uh, the painting again is Monet's Antibe, seen from La Salle, and it's at the Toledo Museum of Art. The title of this poem is Bodies of Water, Discovering Cote d'Azur on Bird Lake. One, in the swirl of teenage years, there is a call beyond tailgates and bowling alleys, beyond pizza and the labyrinth of shopping malls, of hiding in the basement to crank the music forbidden. There is the lure of the town turned gold by the sun. The one stone square where she stands brings Monet's Antibe into her body. It is here she admits the letters she's written to herself, the cursive that contains why and God and every last one lone, lonely, alone. The singular strokes on the paper, how they angle for arms, knead the press of letters, the ache away from solitude. She thinks of the violence of one pen pushed into paper, period, the needle through the firmament of pulp, the dot that ends the sentence, the brush that lets the light. This, her way to see the stars. This, her way to avenge an eclipse. And the sudden knowing that the hand is more than itself. Two, she leaves. The world flicks by in fast motion, maybe weeks, maybe hours, until he arrives. The boy who unknowingly stands on the same stone square, his feet in parallel over the once print of hers. Behind him, Hughes's Ophelia, her eyes an invitation to know before her drowned yes. But France is another country, another story. In the orient blues, he travels, transports, fathoms Monet's hand, holding the boar bristle stained with pigment, oil, broken color. Between his fingers, the dot to impasto, feathering to city, the gold of another shore. And they come then, the letters he's written alone, the journal in his pocket scratched with why and God and every last one lone, lonely, alone. 
He insists his mind is stippled, warped, claims no one sees the city I see. But now the waves, an olive branch, and the one question, is the hand in his, only his? Three, press together the cover of front to back, begin to end. Only the text block separates them. They arrive to bodies raised from the page outside the border, that shared stone square. And here on Bird Lake in plein air, she is saying, you stood there too, I felt you. And they understand now, the hand, the words, the sudden skip through the cage of bone, the dried petals now veined with light. On this dock, leading to water, to unknown, there is sunset, then night. The flash of the mariner's green before the moon harnesses the sky. There's the ages, 17. There's these new words yet to be written. The once and open and time, unspined in their mouths, to greet, seal, transform, to open, breathe, mouth to mouth, to give, receive this first kiss. I'm really enjoying the opportunity to, to um, talk about ekphrastic riffing because I'm reading poems that I usually don't in a reading. So this has been really a joy. So again, thank you. Um, the third poem is an ode to the touchtone phone in some ways, um, the push button phone. So not the motion of dialing as you'd have in the rotary phone, but also the sequencing of pattern and memory. And so this is an example of how the visual is coming in to this particular poem. It's also an acrostic poem, which means that each letter at the beginning of each line spells out another phrase. And since you can't see the poem exactly, um, I will give that part away, but the phrase is ram stop now. And the poem is touch tone, random access memory. Four. The former first sound press to get to you. Rattle and hum, 17th track. Seven, follows in the line. Antibes seen from La Salie, silent in its frame. Five, completes the right angle. My blue note kept in your pocket. Six, takes the dash. Shutter open, clicking in the way I look back through you. Three, brings us higher. Trinity, Mary, virginity. One, as farthest point, don't say left. Our hands, Venice from water, Paris, pair is, pair us. Zero, say center, as lowest, empty to ring. Piction blue, together we are sealed under. No, answer, once, twice, switch hook, the way we never remember leaving. And I'm going to come full circle. And the last poem that I'm going to read is, again, a more um, in the traditional vein of the ekphrastic. And I have a, a brief um, story because we're talking about kismet and serendipity before I open with this. So um, I mentioned that I grew up in Toledo and when I was a little girl, I fell in love with the Monet painting. So I would visit the museum and it was one of the stops that I liked to go back to. Once I was a teenager and able to drive, I would drive to the museum by myself and just sit with the painting. And I now know that it was my way, oh, look, there it is. <laughs> that it was my way of uh, connecting to the larger world of art. I didn't know yet that I was a poet, but I knew that I felt home there. And so um, as I began to write, that painting was always at the back of my mind, but it was so close, I never felt that I would ever be able to write about it. 
Uh, and then somehow uh, I ended up writing a poem about the painting directly. And the Toledo Museum of Art had an ekphrastic poetry competition. So I sent it in and it won the competition, which meant that the poem hung next to that painting that I've been in love with since I was a little girl for about six months. So this beautiful circle of gratitude and serendipity. So in many ways, Slide to Unlock is a love letter to my city of Toledo and to the Toledo Museum of Art and to the Libby family um, that set up an endowment in such a way that anyone in the city could visit the museum free of charge. So this is Cote d'Azur, 17 years later, after Claude Monet's Antibes scene from La Salie, Toledo Museum of Art. It begins in gold, this pointing upward of leaves, how the branches rise, propose an unseen union. Note the olive tree, the hidden live in its name, the way it arrives, mouthed, silent, as I love. Wonder about the couple left unpainted, how we imagined ourselves then, stippled as a tangle in the grass, kept from Monet's canvas. How we held this vision in our years of absence, the tinge of me inseparable from the mark of you. What Monet said of this place, it was impossible to paint without gemstones, its beautiful madness, a fairy tale of air and light. Listen to the dazzle of that waiting city, the way it calls us to believe. How we want to dismiss the story, drown innocence in the sea below. After 17 years, a quarry of space between us, I return to this landscape. I open my hand to a fairy tale of air and light. Expect only memory, not the sudden slide of your fingers taking mine, or how we paint ourselves here again into the impossible. That was really good. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I loved being able to see the painting um, at the same time because you could definitely tell, like the uh, where where you were saying the gold coming up and then the proposing of the tree. Yeah. Like, it was nice to see what you were talking about. Yes, thank you so much for bringing <laughs> that. That was terrific. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, that was a. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and now Shante is going to read from uh, his and Gia's book, uh, Spectacle and Gravity. Did I switch that? Gravity and Spectacle, sorry. Uh, Shante Ryan, yes, there's the book, great. Uh, Shante Ryan attended Paradise Valley Community College for one day, but he has published three collections of poetry, Gravity and Spectacle, The Existentialist Cookbook, and Faithful as the Ground. He is a former Copper State Haiku Slam champion, and his poems have appeared in the Three Penny Review, Barrel House, Gargoyle Magazine, and New York Quarterly. He has performed at bookstores, bars, universities, hair salons, museums, and laundromats. <laughs> All right, Sean, okay, take it away. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, Julia, for inviting us into this, and uh, Kim and Nicole for being very accommodating and setting all of this up. Um, since all of this stuff is beyond my uh, expertise, all this kind of technical stuff, you know, I prefer to be awkward in person. Um, but I would like to say huge shout out to Tolson Books for putting this thing together in ways that we could only have dreamed. You know, um, it's not an easy book to lay out and put together. So, you know, David and Brandy and Heather worked a lot of magic with this, and we're very happy with how it turned out. Um, let me just start right into some poems. This is called Compass Needle Pointed Toward Diploma. Littered with frayed cigarette filters, coverless Playboy magazines, indiscriminate fists of older boys and desert scorpions. The desert between third grade and my grandmother's house 
was not a metaphor of punctured bicycle tires and 22 caliber shells. It was a wasteland of broken curfews and beer bottles, and I was thirsty for more hollow to pour into the shape of your absence. As truant kids colored the sky, newer shades of real, with cartons of nicotine crayons. A wasteland where sunshine illuminated its stench. So I plucked a fermented chunk of shattered Michelob glass from the dust and finally identified my uncle's mysterious cologne. So a lot of these poems kind of take place out here in the Southwest, in the desert. Um, so really the only thing I would let you know before this poem is that the area code for Phoenix is 602. So that's kind of where the title comes from. This is the poem that read with Julie the one time we read together in Phoenix. So. 66602. The Sonoran Desert is an hourglass knocked on its side. From each of the four directions, saguaros flip you off. Remember not to feed or pet squirrels without fur called scorpions. Photo radar cameras line the 101 corridor, making the Pima Freeway the world's most expensive photo booth. The monsoon sun is a billboard advertising back sweat, and the official state bird of Arizona is the ceiling fan. Half the citizens of Phoenix are transplants from Michigan, while the other half are trying to move to Portland. The afternoon breeze cauterized your ear as clerks on a smoke break proved that the sidewalk is indeed hot enough to fry a cigarette. Click buzz bait. You've been reading this sonnet wrong your whole life. Like 14 things that prove dogs are nobody's friend. Like 12 horoscopes Germans can't explain to millennials. But what this next single mom wronged will blow your time. Will shock you like 17 flight attendants who are not having their best day during breastfeeding layovers in the only time zone for introverts. Take this Netflix quiz to find out which character you would be from the film of the Hubble Space Telescope's ultraviolet flyby of the Helix Nebula. You've been feeding this buzz your wrong life, baiting that click feed with seven things to never tell your phlebotomist. Like a guide to which 50 states in America, women who care about their rights should avoid, ranked in no particular order. Um, let's see, so, when we were creating this, you know, G and I, you went to a lot of weird places to take a lot of these photos. So we were participating in a lot of the situations that we're writing about and taking photos, you know, like here's uh, us at the record release for AJJ's The Bible too. Um, so this is called Forever Like the Stamp on Your Wrist. 18 months of hand-drawn flyers, and suddenly, everyone knows the words. But it's August in Phoenix, so nobody sings along, because air conditioning never opens for my friend's band. They play three and a half songs before the cops show up. Ten dollars in advance, gentrification at the door. Necronauts in the shadows of Legend City. Skinwalkers tethered to car battery cables howl first Fridays from the 1506 Grand Stravenue curb. Bodhi tree framed by four white walls. Bikini lounge dad. Two drink minimum dad. After the luster lost its kaboom, weekend dad was always jealous of Father's Day dad. Just like a paper heart. Randy's house made extravagant kindling. I last saw you shoeless. Sneakers hung from Mike's stand in modified effigy. Crowd surfing to audition pallbearers. 
Now church beckons with gospel claws through headphone sermons. But Sunday morning wax vultures circle thrift store record bins. So a lot of these photos, or I mean, a lot of these poems throughout, throughout this kind of sprinkling in some little mini micro poems that are kind of inspired by a lot of the little local Phoenix bands that I enjoyed over the time. Um, so I'm just going to read some of those throughout here. AJJ at the trunk space. 100 and fuck degrees. All ages art punk sleeper cell crammed into the Grand Wedge room. Dance to student loans. Dance to the rent. Dance to going to work at 6.30 in the morning. Let's, let's hate everything together. Skinwalkers at the fix. Actually, like, here's a, uh, there, there's a, there's Rocky, one of his new bands, but back, back then he was, he was in a band called the Skinwalkers. So this is Skinwalkers at the Fix. Mushrooms from the Willow House, light socket kisses, serving pay what you can fry bread, cooked on an ironing board. Remember that the city was beautiful before they tried to make it beautiful. Color store at the paper heart. Running as the roof collapsed, ashes spiked with pollen. Rushed through the door of the house on fire, trying to rescue flames. Dinosaur love at third space. The fossils were as real as Pangaea, as real as the Mesozoic era, as real as the feathers, as real as the asteroid. But God was invented by the Brontosaurus to test scientists' faith. Vanessa Atalanta at Drip Coffee Lounge. Cardigan years old and one gust of wind away from becoming the kite's marionette. Undressed the way rain smells without creosote. Uh, let's see. You know, it's interesting looking back because it took us like five years to work on this and complete it. And, you know, some of the places in, in this book no longer exist. Some of the people in this book no longer exist. So, um, you know, some of them were unintentional elegies. Um, this one wasn't unintentional though. Um, here's, uh, this one is called Listening to the Soundgarden song where Chris Cornell sings, remember everything's just black or burning sun. We were the last generation to need a voice. Once desperate ways to be heard were cradled in every palm. No one listens like us anymore. Pining for moments entwined with songs only you could sing. Cough syrup psychedelia duct tape down to your boots, a fistful of pennies thrown at the wind. Burning the last candle in a haunted stairwell, smile full of Novocaine, the responsibility of the moment soaked with gasoline. A kiss to lock the cage, this empty prayer heavy in your arms. Heathens plucked a feather that shattered the moon. Now the angels won't Stop barking. Um, just a few more. You know, my, my poems are kind of short, so I'll jam some of them together. But uh, this one, I, I wanted to mention that Gia kind of encouraged me to take some of these poems in some of the directions that uh, the artwork was going. And since the main character, like the mask that was made by artist J.J. Horner, he also started this skate company called Pyramid Country. So we want to try to pay homage to some of those roots and incorporate some, some of that within the context. Um, 
one of the things I loved, you know, as as someone who pays attention to language, I loved all the poetics in skateboarding, even just like naming tricks and everything. So, you know, I thought it'd be really cool to be able to name a bunch of tricks that don't exist. So there's kind of like a mix of some truth and some fiction. It's called Pavement Any Flavor. Laminated maple, stale fish grab, concrete sushi, saran wrap polyurethane roll, sick rotational inertia, grip tape gutter mouth, vegan nicotine, outside of outsiders, sidewalks are neither. Ginger snap, fuck side bail, dark slide Casper flip, Pennywise thoughts in 8-bit technicolor yawn, lip side rail, staircase to hospital gown, already been done. But after swallowing asphalt, never been landed tricks, stuck in the ripplescape of distant mind terrain, footloose bacon grab, Barbie doll toe melt, Chewbacca comb over, Russia collusion scrape, East Side Jefferson high rise move up, film this Andrew Jackson abbreviation, kickback Exeter large tetrahedron collider, the future you know is over. Gravity called the police. Um, so, you know, one of the times we, we actually went to you know, one of the skate parks around here that's next to Cowtown Skateboards and it was interesting the way that we just felt like we kind of just blended in there. <laughs> it's like nobody even seemed to, you know, notice or care. Um, oh, you know, actually, I'm going to show. So this other poem, you know, speaking of skateboarding, uh, we kind of took some of the language, cobbled it together um, from some of the Rodney Mullen interviews and even this book called Mutt, How to Skateboard and Not Kill Yourself. It's his uh, I like kind of an autobiography, but it was written with somebody. And, you know, he's just a fascinating person. He's, you know, one of the greatest skaters ever invented almost everything that's important. And, um, so, you know, coincidentally, they just sold a copy of this at Read It Again Books today. So that was a weird coincidence. But, you know, some of these lines are, you know, cobbled together from, from within that. So this is Stanceless Anti Stance of Rodney Mullen. Sophisticated puppets tinker through the night. No guts for the pool. Parking lot bridge too close to the black hole. The valley is cursed. Tweak every variable into the unseen perspective. Double what nobody noticed. Unravel your stance. All of us should be able to stand the opposite way, but our minds lock like cartilage or bones that fuse after scar tissue grows through your body like weeds. And this last poem I'm going to read, um, I, was, I became very interested in uh, render ghosts, which were kind of like when people create these, you know, cyber models of architecture and things that, are, that they're planning, a lot of times they Photoshop different people in there to try to make it more realistic and let you see what it looks like to scale and you know, with people browsing around there. And, you know, there's a person that tries to trace them back, tries to find the real people that were involved in these. And so um, all of it kind of goes back to the very first image that was Photoshopped when they created Photoshop. So that's kind of where this comes from. Render ghosts of the here and soon. Everything began with a topless Jennifer basking in the shallows of a Bora Bora beach with sun and clouds in 1987, or cloudless sky with Jennifer's and a topless 1987 shallowed sun, or beach top Jennifer less Jennifer's clouding the everything sky until there were topless Jennifer's wearing next season's blouses at twilight cocktail parties on balconies of condos that will never be built and business casual beachless Jennifer's waiting at the gate of the airport's proposed fourth terminal where our mutual strangers make this Jenniferless world familiar enough to believe. So uh, thank you for listening. Thanks for hanging out on a Friday. <laughs> no, that was really fun. I, I like your, your humor and your poetry a lot.
Like uh, God was invented by the brontosaurus and gravity called the police. That's all, that's all great. I love it. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, did, uh, did you and Gia want to talk some about the collaboration of how you put together Gravity and Spectacle? Sure. I, I, sure. I don't know how much of the audience knows that the book is actually a book of photographs and poems. Um, there are about 44 photos that begin the book and um, roughly the same amount of poems uh, that are in the second half that make up Gravity and Spectacle. Um, and it does have its... Um, its origin story, Shante, if you want to talk about that um, with artist J.J. Horner. Uh, just, you know, he's one of my favorite artists and I noticed that he was having a, a yard sale. So I stopped by and I ended up picking up this weird thing that ended up being a mask. And, uh, you know, I didn't have any plans at first, but Gia won an expensive Leica camera. And mm -hmm. we just went out to try to test out her camera, see what it could do. And eventually we started a you know, accumulating all these interesting photos and starting to realize there was something more to it. And then, you know, tried to add poems to it and, and, you know, eventually grew into this. Yeah, absolutely. Had no intention of uh, creating a book. It was um, at, at the very, at, at, I mean, at the very beginning was just about experimentation and fun and really um, being inspired by J.J. Horner's work and, and what did it mean and what could we do with it. And um, there was actually a moment, uh, we, we went out into the desert first and I remember it was about five years ago, roughly about this same time of year, it was hot. Um, and the photos that we started taking were really goofy. We, uh, Shante was posing with this mask on his head and he was walking around and waving and kind of being just goofy and we were just having so much fun. And then there was this one moment, one shot where he was um, next to a chain link fence um, over the cap, which is the Central Arizona Project. It's the waterway in, in Arizona. And uh, he had grasped the chain link fence with his hands. And I think the eyes on the mask were of a certain positioning that when I took the photo, I looked um, in the, the readout and saw the shot. I knew that we had something that was very, very different than the goofy shots that we had had prior. Um, and that kind of takes me back to um, Camera Lucida with uh, Roland Bart and his concepts of studium and punctum. Um, and that kind of has been a guiding force throughout the whole project was finding these uh, photos or these opportunities to take photographs that were, um, you know, that could evoke this emotion that could, um, you know, in the term punctum pierce or or puncture or, or reach a viewer in that way. And so that was kind of the, the, the main turning point was getting to that one photograph and realizing there's something here that we needed to try and explore. That's really cool. Uh, did you guys like I know uh, Shante was saying that he wrote some of the poems to lean into the direction your photos were taking. Did the photos all come before the poetry or were they being written simultaneously as uh, the photos were being taken? Or? It depend every which way, whatever mm -hmm. would work. Sometimes, you know, this came first, sometimes that came first. It, yeah, it was basically every way you could imagine. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, it seems like an awesome collaboration. Yep. I'm glad it uh, turned out so great. Um, and uh, so now you guys wanted to have a discussion about ekphrastic poetry. And we can open it up to the audience too. So if any of the audience have any questions or comments, feel free to say them and we'll uh, respond to them in the conversation. Well, I definitely had a question, Shante and Gia, for you about parallelism. Um, so I noticed that the one photo is um, uh, on page 36, it's grandma's home is not a metaphor. And then the compass needle poem incorporates the language, my grandma's house is not a metaphor. So is that something that was intentional or did it come about later? Or I just love, there was a lot of moments of reflection like that in the book and, and the, the reoccurring, the jackalope also. So I just thought it'd be kind of fun to speak to that. We tried to leave some hints here and there of different elements that tie together in loose or direct ways. So you know, we wanted to leave enough where if somebody did want to look into it more, you know, they could find more through there and more connections. Yeah. 
we really did try to create as much space. Uh, what we didn't want to do was do a one for one where there was a photograph and a poem, a photograph and a poem. Absolutely. In that way, because they didn't, um, we didn't want to tie them to that interpretation. And we yeah. wanted to give enough space for the reader and the viewer to really bring to a narrative their own, you know, whenever you write or you read, you're bringing everything of who you are to the work um, always. So we wanted to allow that space for the reader and the viewer to do that. Um, so there, there's some kind of weaving um, that takes place, but we really did, we were after that space, that, that room for the reader. Yeah. Great. Yeah. You know, Definitely. speaking of connection, mm -hmm. I, I, I if I could ask one question while we're on it, I, I was wondering, since Julia was working on these for so many years, and it, it's all about like cyber connections and you know, telephones and even letters, all these ways of you know, keeping in touch without actually being in touch, for that to suddenly be released during the middle of a pandemic, <laughs> it's almost like you know, like the perfect timing in a weird way, like how much more relevant could that be right now? And, you know, were you surprised to all of a sudden see your book in that context? It, completely. I mean, I, you know, I've had people say, you know, oh, weren't you upset? Weren't you disappointed? And, you know, at first I had a little bit of a period of mourning just because it's my first full length collection. So I've been, you know, putting together in person events and all of that. But Honestly, as, as time's gone on, what I've discovered is that it's part of a larger journey and part of a larger spiritual journey that I can't even begin to understand. And what's happened is people have reached out to me and said, I needed a book like this right now. And I would not be able to be reading if I wasn't on furlough from my job, if I wasn't. And I've been absolutely blown away and very... Um, humbled by that. I don't really know what to do with it. I just know that, you know, when I was working on it, I was so determined to try to explore what this feeling was of this connection without connection or this touch without touch and what's, what's quote unquote real and what's perception. And um, because it fascinates me, you know, the, the intimacy of writing a letter to somebody, you know, you're putting your, your hand on the paper and it's your handwriting. And yet that's something that's fallen by the wayside. And yet, as you're mailing it, you know, are you really connecting? And then when you're texting with somebody, are you really connecting? And, you know, I didn't read a lot of those poems tonight because I wanted to focus on the the image part. But, yeah, I mean, it's been so surreal. And I'm sure for you all, too, you know, having everything come into the world and the world's so different now. So, yeah, it was, you know, we reflected on that a little bit um, when we, we, you know, we talked about all the places that we had gone to photograph. Um, I mean, we've, we've gone out of state, we've gone um, up north uh, in Northern Arizona and, and we can't go to any of those places right now. I mean, all the ways in which we tried to get these, you know, people involved and take um, photographs in crowds or on the light rail, um, none of that is available us, to us right now. So he, mm -hmm. in the book is kind of living this life that we currently can't, which is, you know, really interesting. Yeah. Um, Devin had a question in the comments. Uh, she wanted to know any stories behind the photos. Curious if any if anyone noticed the mask or asked questions. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we had to explain ourselves. <laughs> um, Were there any instances in particular that stood out to you? Yeah, there's um, one of my favorites. As uh, you know, we we went with the. Uh, the, <laughs> the idea that it was just better to apologize after and to not ask for permission. Um, one of the uh, places where Shantae and I were really just nervous, I mean, really, really. Oh, no. I'm froze. Okay. I think it's just Gia who froze. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Well, Shante, do you want to talk about uh, one of the photos? I don't know if this is—I don't know if this is what she was referring to, but I know the one time I was genuinely scared and nervous was when we went into the airport and went mm -hmm. into baggage claim with this, just mainly because there's such <laughs> heightened security there. Yes. And, you know, I'm sure that you know this was a very uh, awkward thing, and I was just really afraid. I didn't want to get tased or you know tackled or anything, and um, that was a nervous moment for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine that would be in very intense in an airport. 
Um, hopefully Gia can make it back in. Uh, but meanwhile, we can continue. If anybody in the audience has more questions, we'll comment on those uh, or we can talk about your guys' stuff while we're waiting. Can you, do you have more questions for Julie, Shante? Well, I, I had a question for Shante and Gia, so hopefully she'll be back soon. But I'm curious mm -hmm. about how um, you all collaborated on the title. How did the title come to you? Mm -hmm. Um, we tried to come up with some words and concepts that would jump out to us about this. Then, you know, what could we do with them? And oh. it, it ended up, we, we put it together almost like we want it to be like, like a place, like an intersection, you know, cause it's, you know, the intersection of like ideas and, um, you know, people and, and art forms and genres. So that was kind of what we had in mind. We wanted to be more like a, almost like an intersection, like those were two streets that were converging. So was it, was it, did you both discuss it together? Did you kind of get one idea and then Gia had a separate idea or? Oh, yeah. That, yeah. No, I, it, it was, it was actually Gia who came up with that title. We, okay. we were discussing it for probably years. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. You know, banding about different you know, words and ideas and, um, she finally came up with that one, and and it kind of fit all the criteria that we were looking for. So, uh, it looks like Paul has a comment that says he's curious about fingerprints that might be visible here and there in the work left by the impressions made on you by your teachers. Um, so, do you guys have any teachers who uh, whose work is visible in your work? I don't know if I'd necessarily narrow it down to teachers, but more like, you know, influences, you know, different, um, you know, not even always poetics, but like a lot with me was more like with a uh, background in film appreciation. And so, you know, a lot of the t times when I am combining these kind of ideas and everything, I, I like to think of it, you know, almost like cinematically, you know, in the way that, some of the filmmakers I loved would put together images and, and, you know, edit di different cuts together. Um, I don't want to go too far into that because there's a huge story with that. So I think that takes a lot of time, but a lot of it has to do with like the, I think it's called the Kalashnikov effect. You know, the early Soviet directors like Sergei Eisenstein, they did a, an experiment with, you know, the showing a, an actor's blank face, then cut to a coffin and then, you know, cut to a bowl of soup and the audiences were wowed that that actor could so subtly convey hunger and, and, you know, sorrow and all this. But it, meanwhile, the actor, it was the same for each one, but the context that comes around it ends up changing your perception of what, what's going on. And so I like to play around with that within the poems a lot. Mm -hmm. That's cool. What about you, Julie? Oh. Uh, what kind yeah. of influences have your teachers been? <laughs> oh, <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, James Dickey was a huge influence. And I, I find, you know, I mentioned full circle moments, but the very first, one of the things that he did in Poetry Workshop was try to break down all of our preconceived notions about writing and poetry. And he did it in his quintessential James Dickey way, which was filled with um, humor but also uh, you kind of had to get past the hard exterior to kind of get to the vulnerability of his teaching. But um, part of what he had us do was start in prose. And the very first prose piece that he asked, well, he asked us to write three different prose pieces, but one of them was to meditate on an object. And the object that I wrote about was a key. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten about that completely uh, until I was working on the cover for Slide to Unlock. And then it all came rolling back to me. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe that that was where I started in this kind of this full circle moment. Um, and one of the things that I had said in that first prose piece was something about uh, that the metal looked like it had been bitten and that the side of the key can look like a profile. And when um, I got the initial copy the galley copy of the book, I showed it to someone and the first thing he said was, the key is a profile. And I thought, oh, wow, that was, I mean, that was something else. So yes, so James Dickey, 
Uh, Jane Hirschfield absolutely um, is a very strong influence and very strong mentor in my work. But you know, it's not just poetry and poetry teachers, it's everything about the world, you know? And, and this was again, something that, that James Dickey often talked about. I, there was, um, I don't know if y'all remember the commercials with Ernest way back when, but he said, you know, you can take inspiration from anywhere. It can be from Dante, it can be from Ernest on TV, it doesn't matter. Um, so I have, you know, there's a poem about Donna Summer, for example, you know, I, just anything that I, kind of gravitated to is what was inspiration for me. But I would say the main, you know, yeah, James and James and Jane. So what about you, Gia? What are some of the influences in your photography? Oh gosh, um so many. I'll, I'm gonna just show a book really quick. I I had a chance to go to the Tate Modern and this book was in the uh, the bookstore and then I knew I just I had to have it. So this this has been kind of a guide. It's a wonderful book, 250 photographs, 200 um, photographers. And there's just one page, it's separated into genres. Um, so I, I find great inspiration and uh, motivation from studying other photographers. Um, I, there's so many that I love. Um, uh, Daido Moriyama, Imogen Cunningham, uh, Steve McCurry, of course, Bruce Davidson. So there's all these kind of influences, and, and then you you take all of those, you you know, you they become kind of the fiber of your own aesthetic, and then you go out and you shoot and you see what happens. Um, but you know, early on when I was studying composition or studying light um, or studying just you know kind of theories behind photography, it was really going to 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 the actual pictures and looking at them closely. Um, that really inspired me. Hmm. Uh, there are a few more questions in the comments. Uh, one for you, Julie. It says, I know that you really wrestled and lived with each word in each poem, though some more with others. Um, was there one that fell together more easily? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really great question. Um, wow. No, I don't think so. As, as I'm, I'm kind of like flipping through in my mind, you know, different ones. I will say though that um, one of the things that I love so much about poetry, at least, you know, it, this has been such a tenant in my life is when it comes to you through the darkness. And the last poem that I read um, was in the manuscript. It was much shorter. It was a very, very different poem. And um, I was going through a lot of kind of dark things and I went back and revisited. Um, and as I started working on it, it just, parts of it just came through me and it became a very different poem. But what was really strange was it was 25 lines. And so then when I went to enter in to submit it for the ecrastic contest at the Toledo Museum of Art, the line limit was 25 lines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always believe there's this kind of magic that's going on and, and it's up to me, at least my, by my belief system, if I'm doing my work as a poet, that the work is coming through me to the page. It's why I still have trouble saying they're my poems because I feel like I'm, curating them or helping to bring them there but part of my job is to stay out of the poem too and allow it be to be what it you know needs to be so yeah okay. great question probably. though <laughs> and probably one of the last questions because we only have two minutes left but Stephen shields asks how did you know when you were finished with your respective books that you had enough art or enough poems I, to be honest, I didn't want to let it go. I didn't want to finish it. I, I, I think I probably could have gone on for years. We, we took upwards of, you know, 5,000 photos and to um, narrow it down to 44 was really difficult. Um, to, to we, we also had other plans. We wanted to take so many other different types of photographs. So I had to say goodbye to those um, intentions. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, we just had to cut it off because I could have gone on forever. Mm -hmm. Do you think you'll pick up any of the other intentions that you had to drop to like make into a new project? Um, I have no idea. I, I don't know. <laughs> there's one. There's one shot, and Shante knows it. That I, I. I mean, I really needed to kind of bring my skill level up to establish the shot. Um, but he knows that I just have to do that for my own, for my own self, not for the book or for promotion or for anything, but just for myself. Um, but. After that, I don't know. I don't know if he lives on this um, the, this uh, persona that we created. I don't know what life he has after. So, okay. what about for for you guys, Julie or for Sean Bay? I you know I don't know that it's ever done. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Shante. 
I was just going to say, we had a lot of stuff, but our book was supposed to come out about two years ago. It just <laughs> wasn't right. good enough. Like we had a lot of stuff, but we just didn't think the material was up to the level that we would want to put out to anyone. So that was the big thing for us. Once we got enough poems and photos that we could actually be proud of, that was the moment when we could finally, you know, put it in a cover and all that. Did you have more to add, Julie? Oh, well, for me, it's never done, right? I mean, it's, it goes back to that uh, statement that is falsely attributed to Van Gogh, but I'm trying to remember who said it now, that all, all good art is uh, only, it's only ever abandoned, right? Never finished, only abandoned. Um, and I, I don't know that I ever really knew exactly when it was done. And I keep writing telephone poems, so I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I, I could stop, but it's like that, you know, again, they've chosen to come through me. Um, but for the poems that are in the collection, um, there must be a whole separate collection of poems that never even made it. So the process, you know, I, I am relating so deeply to what Shantae and Gia are saying, because you keep going back. Uh, to bring from the excellence the better still, which is another mm -hmm. James Dickey quote, because you know you look at it and you just go, oh, that, but something else could be done. And so eventually you have to be able to let go. But I don't know that there was ever a point where I knew it was quote unquote done. I just know that I kept adding and tweaking and then eventually you don't wanna do too much with it. But I will say briefly for my process that what was my saving grace truly was being able to have residency experience. So. Um, I owe so much of this book to Virginia Center for the Creative Arts because without that time away from my regular life to really focus and commune with the poems, I don't know how I would have managed to put all of that together. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and the Power Literary Center too. Yeah. yeah. And thank you guys. And thanks Love to Shante, you. even though he disappeared. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but everybody should should buy his and Gia's book, Gravity and Spectacle, and Julie's book, Slide to Unlock. Uh, you can get it at our website or in go. store <laughs> at Read Again. Um, and next week we're going to have, we're continuing the series. So next week is going to be Bridget Lowe and Stephen Kleinman. So everybody should tune back in next week at eight o'clock then. And um, thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you so much. <laughs>